I want to invite your attention to a passage found in the book of 1 John, the fifth chapter, and I want to begin reading there in verse 13. 1 John chapter 5 and beginning there in verse 13. John said, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death, and I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. For a little while, I want to talk from these passages as found in the epistle of John. But first of all, I want to just say this. That we live in a world that is filled with uncertainties. We are unsure what's going to happen from moment to moment, day to day, week to week. We have no idea. There are many things in our life that are completely uncertain. In fact, we live in a world that's filled with uncertainty. As a society, for example, we are so concerned about circumstances and we are so uncertain about them that many times we spend large sums and large percentages of our money on insurance policies, warranties, and guarantees, all with a possible contingency in life in the back of our mind to cover every one of those. There's even people today that spend large sums of money on mediums, astrologers, and fortune tellers, all for the purpose of trying to grasp some insight into the otherwise unknown future. And all of this is for the purpose of removing some of the fear of uncertainty. I haven't seen it in a very long time, but when I was a kid, I remember seeing bumper stickers. Maybe you've seen them too. But I remember seeing bumper stickers and signs that said, the only things in life that are certain are death and taxes. Remember that? We used to see that from time to time. And all of that's because we live in a world that's filled with uncertainty. But the Christian has around him, because it's found in the Word of God, the child of God, because of the Bible, has certainties that we can hang our hat on in this life. For example, we are certain how the universe began, and we are certain how it will end. We are certain why and how God created everything. That in the very beginning, He literally spoke everything into existence, and it was so. We are certain why people behave the way that they do. We are certain about what is right and what is wrong. We are certain about the elements that make for good human relationships. We are certain about how to get to heaven. We are certain that hell waits for the disobedient and for the ungodly. We are certain about God's promises. We're certain about His Son and our Savior. We are certain about His substitutionary death on the cross, His literal resurrection, and we are certain that one day He will come again in God's appointed time. So in a world of uncertainty, we, the child of God, lives by a standard of absolutes. For a little while tonight, I want to talk about two things. Two great certainties for the child of God. Now I want to say this. Somebody said one time, that in the writings of John, they are filled with encouraging words. In fact, one said one time that the, the great news of the gospel is the great news in, in the gospel according to John because it's a message of salvation. But the epistle of John is also great news because it's a message of assurance. Look at verse 13 of our text really quickly, and we're going to notice our first point. And by the way, if we don't have this, we don't have anything. If we don't have this, then nothing else in our life matters. It doesn't matter what we achieve. It doesn't matter all the accolades that may come our way. Nothing in the world will matter if we do not have this. But the child of God has an assurance and a certainty. Number one, here it is, to know that we are saved. 
In verse 13 of our text, John said, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. John right here is telling Christians why he's writing. He's telling them he's writing to give them an assurance of eternal life. Now i got to say, there are sometimes things in our life that we come to know over a period of time. I was a painting contractor for 24 years. I don't know how it is in the state of Missouri, but I'm going to tell you how it is in the state of California. If you go into the unions, for example, you start off as a first period apprentice. And it is a five, it is a ten period apprenticeship, nine and out. And what it is over a period of five years, a person starts learning at the very beginning as a first period apprentice. And by the way, if you're a first period apprentice painter, you don't get to hold a paintbrush, you don't even get to hold a caulking gun. You hold a piece of sandpaper and a couple of buckets and that's it. And then you kind of gradually learn a little bit more and they let you handle a caulking gun. And then one day, all of a sudden, you spend all this time and some journeyman hands you a paintbrush and you get to prime something. Big stuff. My point is, you learn the trade over a period of time. And there are many things in our life that we have knowledge of today that we didn't have knowledge of a year ago. Why? Because we've come to learn them over time. The word no in this passage is found 39 times in the epistle of John, and it does not mean to learn gradually. He said, I'm writing these things to you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. That word no means to know for certain. It means to know in the here and now. Got to make a point, though. There's a difference between assurance and and arrogance and there's a difference between confidence and conceit I'm not saying that we are saved by our own meritorious works I'm not saying that at all and all the things that I will do in my life you know what if I keep everything if I do everything you know what I am the Bible says that I am an unprofitable servant saved by grace you know, the spin that I have on that is really kind of like this, to practically apply it. What does that mean? I've heard people say, you see, if I do everything that the Bible says, I'm just going to barely make it. Does that sound like Peter said, having an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom one day? That doesn't sound like that to me. It doesn't mean that if I'm an unprofitable servant saved by grace, it doesn't mean that if I keep the commandments of God, I'm going to barely squeak in. It doesn't mean that at all. What that means is, and I think that's what's talking about, about the idea of being an unprofitable servant. If I hire Shahe and I pay Shahe $10 an hour, and I sub him out to somebody else for the services that I've contracted out, and I charge $20 an hour on Shahe. You know what Shahe is? He is a profitable servant. Now, I will never become a profitable servant to Jesus because I will never mean more to Jesus than he means to me. I am still going to be an unprofitable servant, still not going to deserve it. It still will be a gift and it still will be grace. But it doesn't mean I'm going to barely squeak in. I'm going to tell you, if I make it to heaven, we're going to kick the doors down. We're going in with an abundant entrance, the Bible says, if we make it. To know for certain. Stott says that this does not mean that we gradually grow in certainty, but that we will possess it in the here and now, a present certainty that we are saved. I have to make another point. I am not saying a doctrine, I don't believe in a doctrine, you know this already, of once saved, always saved. I'm not saying that at all. And the Bible is clear that if I don't keep the commandments and I don't keep living the Christian life as I should, I fall from grace. And if I do not make those things right, I'll be lost. I know that. I'm not preaching a doctrine of once saved, always saved. But please understand this. Sometimes our people believe in the concept of once saved, forever lost. We can have an assurance and a confidence that we have eternal life. Now, the same author 
the same author that gave the assurance is the same author that gave the conditions. There are conditions to our salvation. You know, we can uh, basically sum it up this way. There are two things that we have to fit or fill conditions-wise. Number one, we have to break with sin. And number two, we have to obey the truth for the rest of our life. Everything in the, in the Christian life falls into that category. There are conditions on fellowship. We have to break with sin and we have to obey the truth. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6, the conditions of fellowship. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now I'll tell you something, folks. You know how we know if we're in fellowship with somebody? Here it is. How do you know? How do I know if I'm in fellowship? I'm talking about spiritual fellowship. I'm not talking about just being friends. I'm talking about spiritual fellowship. How do I know? The only way that I can know if I'm in fellowship with somebody else is these conditions. Number one, if I am in fellowship with God because I do not walk in darkness, I walk in the light. If I am in fellowship with God and another person is in fellowship with God, then we are in fellowship with each other. But if I'm in fellowship with God, and this other person over here is not in spiritual fellowship with God, there's no way we can be in fellowship with each other. We are not. We are divided. We are separate. How do we know? If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. All right, listen to this. In verse 9, 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and number two, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, maybe you've heard Brother Joe Heisel over the years use this example. He used the example. There was a sister in Christ, and he was holding a meeting somewhere, and he offered the invitation, and here comes this sister walking down the aisle with tears streaming down her face. She came up, and the song was over, and she's sitting down next to Brother Joe, and she tells Brother Joe, I have sinned, and I've been asking God to forgive me for 20 years. I've been asking for forgiveness for 20 years, and I'm scared to death I'm not forgiven. Did you know that she was forgiven the first time? Let me read the passage again. Listen to this. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to do two things. One, forgive us our sins, and two, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, what does the word confess mean? The word confess does not mean reluctant admission. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you get busted and your parents are, they got you dead to rights and you deny it until you can't and you reluctantly admit. It's kind of like these police shows. I like these police shows. I like the investigation shows. And they get some guy in the hot box in there and they start grilling this guy. And they say, we got you dead to rights. We saw you. We got all these witnesses. And it wasn't me. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. And pretty soon, after hours of wearing the guy down, you know what he says? All right, I admit it. I confess. That is not this word. This word confess is the word humilegio. It's a compound word. It comes from two other words, uh, homus and lego, and it means to say the same thing. In other words, when you confess to God your sins, you do it in this fashion, with godly sorrow, with repentance, and you do it in such a way that you literally are saying the same thing about that sin that God says about that sin. And you know what happens? He forgives every sin and even cleanses you from all unrighteousness one scholar said that literally means he removes the contamination even of that sin it's gone do you remember when Jesus gave the example of the Pharisee and the publican I'm not going to talk about the Pharisee tonight I just want to make a point about the tax collector do you remember when Jesus describes these two guys and you got the Pharisee over there and he's basically thanking God for all the great things that he is and you know, really, he, he, he might as well just say, uh, praise God for the way he did such a wonderful job on him and, and how I turned out so great, did a great job on me. He might as well have said that. 
What about the flip side? What about the guy that was a tax collector? What about the guy that was guilty of extortion? What about the guy that was a sinner and recognized it? And the Bible says, that, G and Jesus describes this man, this man won't even look up toward the heavens. He bows his head down. He smote his breath, breast as an outward sign of inward anguish. And he says what? God be merciful to me, the original says this, the sinner. You know what that is? That's humilegio. That's saying the same thing about your sin that God says about that sin. That's confession of sins with repentance and godly sorrow. And when you do that, you are forgiven like it never, ever happened. Chapter 2 and verse 1 of 1 John. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. John pictures Jesus as our lawyer, pleading our case, if you will, when we sin. And we're going to make mistakes. We certainly are. And when we do, we literally throw ourselves, as it were, on the mercy of the court and beg for God's forgiveness. And Jesus, who is our propitiation, in that He paid our fine for us. And God, for Christ's sake, forgives us. All right. What if you went up to somebody tomorrow and you said, are you saved? What if you went up to somebody and you asked them, are you saved? You're going to get all kinds of ideas. If you go up to people in the world and you say, are you saved? Somebody might say, well, yeah. Or somebody might say, well, I think so. Somebody might say, well, I hope so. Very few people are going to say, nope, nope, not me, going straight to hell. The question is, can you know? The answer is, yes, you can. Here it is. There's a threefold test. John gives it. Here's number one. The obedience test. And it's found in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. Listen to this. Now by this we know, there's that word again, to know for certain, same word. By this we know that we know Him. That's a different word. That's a relationship. We know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. So let's just plug in the words of what they mean. By this... We are certain that we have a relationship with God if we keep His commandments. Now, the first thing that a person has to do is obey the gospel. If a person does not obey the gospel, that's the obedience test, that's first and foremost, they're not going to be saved. That's the first thing. Everybody must come to Jesus, come believing in Jesus, repenting of their sins, confess His name as the Son of God, and be baptized in water for the remission of sins. But it doesn't end there. The rest of our life is to be filled with obedience. Obedience to the Word of God. Obedience by the way that we worship. Obedience by the way that we live, by the things that we teach, by the things that we practice, by the way that we dress, and on and on and on according to the Word of God. The obedience test. Secondly, though, secondly, is the disciple test. And it's found in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Here it is. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walks. So, first and foremost, I have to pass the obedience test. Am I doing that? First, am I a Christian? Have I obeyed the gospel? And am I obedient to the Word of God in my life? That's number one. Go to the next one. Am I walking as He walked? If I say I'm a disciple of Christ, I need to be more like Christ in my life. Now I'm going to tell you, you are never in your life going to live it in sinless perfection. You will not. And neither will I. But our goal, Jesus is the bar. Jesus is the standard. We need to strive to be more like Jesus in everything that we do in our life. The disciple test. But thirdly, this is the hard one. Sometimes we say, oh, absolutely, I obey the Word of God. Absolutely, I'm trying to walk as He walked, keeping sin out of my life and all that. But then there comes the third test. You know what it is? It's the love test. Oh, people misunderstand love. In 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, 
He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness unto now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, I don't think I'm speaking to anyone here that is guilty of not loving their brother. What I've seen in a few days that I've been here is a congregation filled with wonderful people and as an outsider looking in, you appear to be people that love each other. And you demonstrate that with kindness one to the other. So I don't think I'm talking to anybody here tonight. But let me just say, there is a third test and it's called the love test. And if I say that I walk in the light but I hate my brother, I'm a liar and I'm in darkness. now. What did we say a few nights ago? I think it was back Sunday night. I made the point about love and what love means and what hate means and all that. The way that you demonstrate whether you love or hate someone is by the way that you treat someone. I'm going to tell you, there are people that will not give you the warm fuzzies. There are people that just don't give you that warm sensation inside that you feel love for. And there are people in your life that you love without having anyone command you to love them. You love them naturally. That's not this word. That is phileo. I'm talking about agape love. It's a love of service and sacrifice to others. And by the way, it's always the love that's attributed to God. And He gave the greatest sacrifice of all. He gave His Son for the sins of the world. And by the way, it's kind of hard enough even... It's hard enough even to love your neighbor. I've had some neighbors that really weren't lo worth loving. It's hard sometimes to love your neighbor. But Jesus said, go a step further and love your enemy. What's that mean? That means by the way that you treat them. But the greatest way that you can demonstrate love to them is that you still have a desire, even though they're rotten, 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 you still have a desire that they go to heaven. You want them to be saved too. You want their soul to be saved too. That's the epitome, that's the highest point of your demonstration of love for them. Am I saved? Am I passing the obedience test? Am I passing the disciple test? Am I passing the love test? All right. There's something else that's great. And I want you to get this, please. Because this is a blessing that the world does not have. Number one, a blessing the world doesn't have is to know that you have eternal life. That's number one. Another blessing the world doesn't have, it's right now. You know what it is? Confidence in prayer. That God actually hears our prayer. I'm going to talk about what that actually means in a minute. But I want to talk about confidence in prayer. 1 John 5, 14, listen to this. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. The word confidence comes from the Greek word, which refers to boldness and freedom with which one speaks. It's uh, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 21 and 22, it speaks of boldness in our prayer life. Notice, beloved, if our heart, which is the mind, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God that whatever we ask, we receive from Him because why? Two things. We keep His commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Okay. Verse John 5, 14. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. What is God's will? What is it? It's what God wills, what God desires, what God wants, or what God allows. And to pray according to His will is to pray with that provision. When Jesus in Matthew 26 was in the garden, He prayed to His Father. Three times he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. In other words, he poured his heart out to God, but he put it all in the hands of God. He said, if it really is your will. You remember last night I said very quickly in passing that when you pray according to God's will with that provision and you say those words, you have to mean it and you have to actually be okay with the answer. If you're not going to be okay with the answer, don't pray if it's your will, because you don't mean it. 
If you pray according to God's will and you say, if it be your will, you have to mean it. You have to be okay with the answer. All right. What does it mean to hear? Listen. God hears the audible sound of everything. To say that God cannot hear the audible sounds that are in the world of a sinner praying is to limit God. I've heard people say that. God can't even hear the audible sound. In other words, it's blocked off. He's not even capable of hearing the audible sound of a sinner. That's not what that means. God hears everything. So what does it mean, the promise to the child of God, what does it mean that God hears a Christian's prayer? Here it is. The very fact that he hears prayer, W.E. Vine says, signifies that he answers prayer. In other words, God hears the audible sound of everything, but he only answers his children. That's the difference. That's a great blessing. The word here presupposes a response. You remember that country song years ago? Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Interesting, isn't it? It's the worldly concept that if you ask for something and you don't get it, that God didn't answer it. Okay? I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a child of God and you ask in faith, believing according to God's will, God answers every single prayer you pray. I want to tell you a little story, just a little example of something that happened to me. Years ago as a painting contractor when I was still doing that, you know, one of the things, one of the challenges that you have in business, as you know, no doubt, you got to try to round up enough work to keep your guys working all the time. But at the same time, you have to have enough cash flow that you can pay your bills and you have to have some good jobs that you have some volume so that the company gets well. You need all that. There's a hotel downtown Bakersfield called the Padre Hotel. Years and years and years ago, it was a very famous hotel. Very nice. Had theme rooms and all this. You know what happened over time? It became a, a home for slums. Homeless people lived there. It was run down to nothing. It was awful. Disgusting. There was a company down south in the Los Angeles area, and you know what they did? They bought the Padre Hotel, and they said, we are going to refurbish the whole thing. We're going to restore the whole thing, and all that. I got to tell you, I wore my knees out praying that God would give me that job. I wanted that job so bad. You know why? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, this is the job. We're going to have cash flow. It's going to keep my guys working for a long, long time. It's going to be all that. It's going to be great. It's going to take all this pressure off, right? I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And the outside of the bid, the outside alone was over $100,000 worth of painting. I didn't get it. I was disappointed. Really disappointed. You know what happened? There was some new fellow that got his license. You have to have a contractor's license to contract in California. He got his license. He went and he got the job. Oh, he was just absolutely just happy as can be when you talk to him. You know what happened? He did the work and got beat out of every dime. He got beat out of every penny and it broke his company. All I'm saying is, in my mind, this is the job. And God said no. Sometimes God knows more than we know. Now, I'm not saying that. It's not a testimonial. I don't do that. A testimonial, I think, is wrong because when you people give testimonials, what they're doing is they're attracting attention to themselves. I'm just giving you a little example. I thought, I was wrong, I thought this was it. God knew more than me. And I'm thankful now that God said no. He said no to my request. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 24, we find also we must ask in faith believing. Therefore I say to you, whatever you ask, when you pray, believe that you will have it and you will have them. The blessings are for his children only. You remember in John chapter 9 when Jesus heals the man that was born blind? 
You remember when they tried to say, the Pharisees tried to say, oh, he's a sinner and all that? Remember what happens? The man that was born blind said this, now we know that God does not hear, that means answer, he does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears, and that word simply means answers. Look at 1 John 5 and verse 15. Watch this. And if, and that word means since, since we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. In other words, we have so much confidence that God is going to answer our prayers. That when we bow the knee before Him and we pour our heart out to Him and we pray in faith, believing, and we pray according to God's will, as we're actually making the petition, we know that God's answering that prayer. Great confidence. Great blessings for the child of God. All right. But now we got to come down to one final thing. we got to talk about a passage found in verse 16 that sometimes is really misunderstood. Let's talk about that verse. Let me read it first. We'll break it down. 1 John 5, 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There's a sin leading to death, and I do not say that he should pray about that. All right. You got two kinds of prayers, it seems like. Two kinds of sins here, it says. One, you got a sin that is not unto death. And two, you got a sin that is unto death. And John says, if you see a brother and he's sinning a sin that is not unto death, that's the King James. The New King James says, leading to death. You will ask and God will give strength. God will bless that person. God will do that. Give life for the one who has committed a sin that is not leading to death. All right. What kind of death is that talking about? You can pick up a commentary and it'll say, I read a commentator one time It said, well, that death is physical death. And what it means is you can ask God to forgive you of any kind of sin except the one that leads to capital punishment. Is that what it's talking about? I've heard another say this, oh, it's physical death. And therefore, as long as a person doesn't die, then they still can be forgiven. But if they commit a sin that takes their life, they can't be forgiven. Is that what that's talking about? Absolutely not. Folks, it's talking about spiritual life and spiritual death. The entire epistle is filled with what? Spiritual life and spiritual death. What does John already say? He says we go from what? From death to life. Now he wasn't talking about people being raised from the dead. He's talking about spiritual death and spiritual life. And when we come to Christ, in Christ, we have spiritual life. So what he's talking about is, he's talking about a sin that does not lead to spiritual death you ask God, and God will give life for the one who commits such a sin. All right. What's the sin unto death then? What is that? What's the sin that is unto death? What's the big bad sin? All kinds of ideas people think. Some say it's the unpardonable sin of Matthew 12 and Mark 3. Some say it's the willful sin of Hebrews chapter 10, and on and on and on. What is the sin that leads to spiritual death? Here it is. Here's the big, bad, terrible, rotten sin. Here it is. Any sin that you will not make right. Any sin that you will not repent of. I'll give you an example. Let's just say that brother so-and-so here, I'll just create a guy. He's out of duty. He leaves the church. He goes out into the world of sin. He doesn't want to make things right. He turns his back on everything he's ever known. He decides to go out into the world and commit sins and be away from the church. Guess what? That is a sin that leads to spiritual death or a separation from God. He won't make it right. He won't repent. John said, if your brother is doing that kind of sin, don't pray for him. Now that doesn't mean don't pray that they come back. That means don't pray that they're forgiven in their sinful state. 
I got loved ones, folks. I got family members, some that are out of duty. I pray for them all the time. I pray that they will repent and come back so that they can be restored and forgiven. I just don't pray for their forgiveness while they're in that state. Because until they come back, they are committing a sin that leads to spiritual separation from God. That's the sin unto spiritual death. Now, let me ask you, what if somebody commits that kind of a sin? What if somebody actually does that? Can they be forgiven? Absolutely. You remember that passage found in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9? That is an absolute of any sin. There's not a sin that you can commit you cannot be forgiven of. Watch this. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay. These are great blessings for the child of God. These are tremendous blessings, folks. And sometimes when you feel as though you're getting discouraged because things are not going your way in your life, remember something. You have something that the world doesn't have. That's a fact. The world might think they have it. They may think they want it. They may stand and, and, and encourage one another with it to make them feel better in days of sorrow and sadness, perhaps when they stand over a newly made grave of a loved one. I don't know. But there's a difference. There's a difference for the child of God. The child of God can know for certain he is saved and know that when he asks God, God will answer his or her prayer. One final thing. Remember last night I closed with the word hope? I want to tell you the difference between the world's hope and our hope. And then I'm finished. There's a difference between the world's hope. You know what the world's hope is? The world's hope is postponed disappointment. I'll give you an example. I love my sister. Love her very much. We're 11 months apart. We're as close to being twins as you can without being twins, I guess. We're 11 months apart, my sister and I. I remember growing up, we'd be watching a football game on TV, and our team was just getting whipped. I don't know, by 40 points with a minute left. And my sister would say, well, don't worry, there's still hope. Yeah, no, there isn't. That's postponed disappointment, because guess what? In one more minute, we got to eat and swallow the fact that we just got waste, we got whipped. Postponed disappointment. That's the world's hope. The child of God has real hope. It's a belief and a trust in God that God is in total and thorough control in our life in both time and eternity. That we can know that when we pillow our head tonight, when we ask God to please clean our slate and please forgive us of any sin that is in our life, we can pillow our heads tonight and know that if the Lord comes back, we're going home. That's a great blessing. Know we're saved and that God answers our prayers. Christian certainties. I'm through tonight.